The West African nation of Nigeria has the second highest number of maternal deaths in the world. More than 36,000 women die here each year trying to have babies. But the country is beginning to fight back and slowly starting to see results. Here's our story. The tension is palpable. It's a matter of life and death here in the maternity ward of Matala Mohammed Hospital in Nigeria. It's one of the busiest maternity centers in all of West Africa, with an average of 30 deliveries in 24 hours. But something is going terribly wrong with one of those deliveries. And Sakina Mohammed's life hangs in the balance. Midwife Aisha Bukhar is desperately trying to help. And I was trying to explain to her that she should bear down because she's carrying a multiple pregnancy. Sakina's husband has raced her to the hospital. At home, there is the possibility of encountering problems. So going to the hospital has its advantages. Much needed advantages as the UN estimates that some 1,000 pregnant women around the world die every day. We noticed she's very weak, so set of IV, 5% destroys for her. Sakina gives birth to her first twin, a healthy girl. But there are complications. The second twin is breech and won't deliver. Dr. Bello Dico, head of obstetrics and gynecology here, fears Sakina could hemorrhage, one of the leading causes of maternal mortality, according to a recent United Nations Population Fund report. Because of the associated complications, the second delivery should not exceed five to 10 minutes. Rich delivery, especially in multiple pregnancy, is a very complicated delivery. There is need for a qualified OBGY doctor. We even called the doctor, but he was not here. But if she, she is about to deliver, we can take the delivery. We do it. The team on call usually, we have four. Two of them must be on ground. But the doctors are often operating and cannot unscrub, he says. That is an emergency. This is an emergency. Sakina labors in pain for close to an hour before the second baby is finally born. It's a boy. He was very severe asphyxia. He need oxygen now, and we don't have oxygen here. And let's use the manual one. It's not working. I don't want the baby to die. I don't want her to miss that baby. That is why I try my all effort to be able to help her or to help the baby too. We cannot leave him like this. He has to see a pediatric doctor. The unit is far. Okay. It's far a little. He had a bad turn. My son needed medical attention. The emergency. Then I asked him to. And we rushed him to the emergency pediatric ward. He should bridge the neck. It's the second twin. First twin then was working. 
Bashi oxygen is what you need to be repeated. While the team is trying to stabilize the baby, Sakina's condition suddenly takes a turn. She begins hemorrhaging and is in need of blood. She lost a lot of blood. She's a bit anemic. She has to receive blood transfusion. They give her this bioplasm here, about two liters. Then they give her normal saline. But time is running out. She only has some six hours before she may bleed to death. Farida Babel is the hospital's head midwife. One of our main problems here, how to get blood. Finding blood is an enormous challenge in Nigeria, where the government estimates one in 25 are infected with the HIV virus. They mobilize people to come and donate blood in the hospital. But now due to this HIV, so we stop this. Sakina's husband, Mohammed, so is asked to this. donate, but they don't know if his blood type will match. They have to go and check the blood group of the husband. Then they compare if it's the same with her own. If it's not the same blood group. The husband must buy the blood. With time running out, the race to find blood begins. So all these things takes time and delay, and it causes the death of the woman. That is most of the thing that causes the death of our women here. Mohammed's search for Sakina's rare blood type takes him to surrounding hospitals and private blood suppliers. One pint of blood costs the equivalent of nearly 70 US dollars. The average Nigerian makes just over $90 a month. His frantic search continues for three long hours. It is really disheartening to see a patient dying for a preventable cause. As far as I'm concerned, hemorrhage is a preventable cause. Mohammed finally locates the blood and he races it to the hospital. He's made it in time, and Sakina receives the blood transfusion. But their struggle isn't over. Two days later, the second twin, their baby boy, is in peril yet again. I don't think the baby's alive. You don't think? I don't think. We have a teaching in the religion of Islam that states, what Allah gives belongs to him, and what he takes also belongs to him. All of us are from Allah, and at some point, sooner or later, we shall all return to Allah. Even though we know it hurts, we can only accept its outcome. Trying to avoid that deadly outcome is another woman at the hospital, Aisha Ibrahim. She gave birth to her eighth child at home and was rushed to the hospital, hemorrhaging and in shock. 
Her husband, Kabiru, fears for her life. My wife, Aisha, bled too much with her last two deliveries. So I made sure during this delivery, I would stay close by to support her. Also close by was her sister-in-law. Honestly, when we brought her to the hospital, in her own words, she kept saying, she was going to die, she was going to die. Her blood pressure is too low to measure. They just come at the dying minutes. They set a drip, normal saline and isoplasma for her. Then we apply the anti-shock garment. The anti-shock garment, a full body suit first conceived of by the US Space Agency, is used to treat shock by shunting blood from the extremities and back to the vital organs. Then once you put it, within a short time, when you check the vital signs, you'll find there is BP, there is pus. The woman is coming back. The anti-shock garment is just a way of buying time before you can procure uh, blood, blood for the transfusion of this woman. The time that we didn't have this anti-shock garment, the woman will just die because there's nothing we can do. With the few extra hours they now have, Aisha's husband, whose first wife died in childbirth, goes searching for blood. Immediately she came, we took her blood sample for the relation to go for blood cross-matching and grouping, but still yet you can see how many hours ago. No blood yet. After looking for five hours, Kabiru finally finds two pints of Aisha's blood type. Blood pressure is 120, 180. 120, 80. It's normal. The pints save Aisha's life. But Dr. Diko remains frustrated by the lack of supply for his maternity patients. And so he successfully lobbied health officials for his own blood bank something which would reduce waiting times for blood by 75%. So can I open the frame for you? Yes, please, please, please. OK. If you go inside the blood bank now, the two fridges is almost packed full. A lot has changed. It reduced delay in having the blood. The midwives got the blood, they set the blood, and then it quickly saves the lives of that patients. So you can see even in our reduction of maternal mortality, it's just very few now. It's very low, yes. Aisha is discharged after 16 days, grateful to be alive. Sakina, meanwhile, is released after more than a week in the hospital. She and her husband are left to seek comfort from their tiny surviving daughter. Each and every one of us came out of the woman. As long as there is one maternal mortality, it's a family mortality.